Hello, students. This is Professor Gore, and uh, in this topic, we're going to be talking about uh, the New Deal part of the Great Depression. So at the end of the Roaring Twenties uh, recorded lecture in part three, I covered uh, the stock market crash because it does begin in 1929, and then uh, briefly covered Ho Herbert Hoover's uh, presidency. So as a recap from that, Herbert Hoover did not believe in direct relief to the American public uh, with the Great Depression. He believed in indirect relief. So give money to some of the biggest uh, businesses and industries and then hopes <clears throat> that the money would trickle down and they'd be able to hire. He also challenged uh, states to uh, go ahead and uh, hire um workers and so forth for different state infrastructure projects and so forth. Um, and then uh, really encourage uh, charitable giving and so forth. Now, uh, FDR is going to come in and instead of providing indirect relief, he's going to provide direct relief. And uh, the Democrats are going to sweep into office uh, and Congress and FDR is going to pass more legislation. You know, the president in American history. Now, keep in mind, FDR uh, did have an advantage. <clears throat> First, he's, he was elected four times. No, the president in American history has done that. Secondly, um, he came into office during the worst economic depression in American history. And so naturally, those are two different um, um, reasons why um, he could pass more than any other president in American history. And we're going to talk about FDR and his uniqueness um, to be able to uh, connect to the American public and to the uh, press. And um, he's one of our most talented politicians in American history uh, and so forth. So let's look at what um, the Great Depression, um, you look at Germany, um, their unemployment rate was terrible. Um, and then 1932, uh, around that time period, the 31, 32 was when uh, the Nazi party took over and uh, began, Hitler and the Nazis began um, uh, implementing these massive um, uh, infrastructure projects and rebuilding the German military. And so eventually the unemployment rate is gonna shrink significantly. Um, uh, the rise of Nazism. And by the time World War II begins, the, the German economy um, is rocking and rolling. You look at Japan, Japan doesn't have the bad economic depression the way other countries did in terms of unemployment. Now, one of the things that's going to lead to Japan um, wanting to gain an overseas em uh, empire, particularly when they invade in Manchuria, uh, which is northeastern China, and then all of China in 1937, is they wanted to be economically self-sufficient and then um, kind of free from <clears throat> the whims of the of the international uh, economic climate and they want to become economically sufficient not dependent on international markets and that's one of the one of the the, the causes of japan's expansion into an empire great britain um their unemployment rate is bad not as bad as the united states the united states can have the worst unemployment the longest economic depression uh, more so than Britain or Japan or Germany and so forth. So you can look at this, the United States unemployment rate, 1932, 1933 is terrible, but notice the unemployment rate um, stays much higher for longer. Um, and, and we're going to have a double dip recession uh, in 1937 that I'll cover in a later part. So 1932 election, I covered this at the end of the Roaring Twenties, part three lecture, but um, this is a political cartoon um, talking about we demand a new deal, hence, FDR's New Deal program. Okay, so you look at 1932 election is one of the greatest uh, political um, spankings that uh, anybody's ever put on somebody uh, in American uh, politics. Now there, there's actually worse elections in American history. LBJ is going to win by a huge margin. So is uh, Richard Nixon uh, in, in the uh, 60s, which is surprising. Um, but FDR is going to do very well um, in the election now. You look at the electoral votes. I mean, my word, he, he mops the floor with Hoover, but uh, popular vote wasn't as big of a, it is a big victory, but not as bad as uh, one might expect um, for that time. I mean, you see the socialists and communists even have a candidate at this time as well. Now, FDR um, was a, not only a brilliant politician, um, he, he has something, um, what we like to call uh, in psychology, charm. Um, you can't teach that. Um, you either have it or you don't. And FDR was was brilliant at it um, because of his uh, outbreak of adult form of polio after he had lost the vice presidential candidate in the 1920s. Uh, he uh, contracted at a Boy Scout camp, actually. And um, um, he said once he spent an entire year being able to move his big toe, finally, everything else seemed easy. Um, it humbled him. 
and it forever changed FDR, uh, the course of his history um, and his life and so forth. Um, it, it forever changed him. Now, you notice that in this picture on the right, Hoover does not look happy, um, but he's got a blanket covering up his legs. It's hiding his braces. Um, and a lot of times the press, more so than any other president in American history, protected him. They loved him. He made him laugh. He made him feel special. Um, now, he could put on um, a great uh, show. Now, in private, he sometimes would, would, would be a little more defeated and so forth. But in public, he had this sense of humor and charm that you just can't teach. And that's why the press protected him. Most of the American public did not know that he wore braces and could not walk and so forth. Um, this is uh, in reference to eventually what's going to be the uh, um, another amendment, the 20th Amendment, that is going to uh, make it where a president's going to move up their inauguration from March to, to January uh, 20th time frame. And so um, that's going to end that lame duck time period. So you have a president leaving office, Congress not really going to pass anything, and they're really not doing much um, besides gathering a paycheck. And so this is going to move it up where the president's going to be elected in November and then inaugurated in third week of January. Now, you got to have that six week time frame between the, the election and uh, your inauguration to figure out your cabinet, um, have Congress approve your cabinet and so forth. Um, you need that time to kind of get things ready. Plus, the, the outgoing president has to pack up the White House and you have to have a change of the guard uh, and so forth. And so there's another book cartoon where FDR looks, looks like he's walking in, which that would not have been uh, possible. He would have rode in on a wheelchair and Hoover is leaving to go fishing. That's one of the most famous uh, inauguration um, lines in, in American presidential history, along with JFK's, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, among other things. Lincoln's uh, inauguration, particularly his second, or second inauguration, 1964. Uh, but that's one of the most famous lines because he comes into a time of crisis. Now, one thing that, that is going to give FDR an advantage over just about any other American president other than maybe Lincoln um, in terms of being seen as a great president is oftentimes great presidents come um, are, are made in a time of crisis. FDR is going to face two of the biggest crises in American history. He's going to face the Great Depression and he's going to face World War II. The only other crisis that compete with that in American history is the American Civil War, which is what Lincoln deals with. Um, and so one of the things that uh, FDR is going to do, he's going to be a brilliant communicator. Um, in fact, uh, one of the later presidents that's going to emulate FDR is Ronald Reagan, who also had great charm and a great sense of humor um, and so forth. So what FDR did is because Americans listen to their radios pretty frequently, um, he would give a series of what's called fireside chats in the sense that you'd be listening to the radio um, up next to the, uh, the fire at night. And so what he does is he tells the American public, OK, here's what we're trying. Um, here's what this New Deal agency is going to do. If you're a young man um, to the age, uh, between 18 and 25, why don't you apply with the Civilian Conservation Corps and you can find jobs in the outside and 25 percent of your paycheck will go towards your families and so forth. So what he does is he, he speaks to the American public and he explains things. And it, it restores confidence in the country. And because of his fireside chats, he gets people to actually put money in banks again, um, and which is tremendously important because in order for a thriving economy, is you've got to have banks lending money for business and economic growth. Um, any economist will tell you that, that, you know, a sign of a good economy is banks are lending money. OK, uh, and so forth. And so when they're not lending money, that's a sign of a bad and weak economy. And so he's going to help restore confidence in the American banking system by saying, hey, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation is backing your money up by the United States Treasury. So if this bank collapses, your money is protected. If Americans don't hear that, they're not going to put their money into banks. OK, so let's look at uh, um, this New Deal program. It is going to expand this, uh, the, the size and scope of the, of the American government more so than any other president before him. OK. Um, a lot of the New Deal programs are going to end with World War II. You know why? Because World War II gets the country out of the Great Depression. It's not the New Deal that gets the country out of the Great Depression. It is World War II. That is, without question, um, every historian agrees on that. World War II spending and, and the economy is what propels us out of the Great Depression. Now, what, what the New Deal does 
is it prevents us from from having economic collapse and going into socialism. So I like to tell students as a simple analogy, the New Deal is the country treading water. It's not drowning, but it's not swimming out of the water either. World War II is the United States swimming out of out of the water and getting onto land. Um, so we're treading water here. <clears throat> Some New Deal programs are going to last permanently, like Social Security is still around today. Um, the uh, uh, couple other uh, agencies with lending um, for housing and so forth. Uh, and I'll cover that in just a minute. I've gone blank for just a second. My apologies. Uh, but you're going to have some other New Deal programs that are going to be around today. One of the things I'm, I'm, I'm most ex happy that's still around is the Federal Deposit and Insurance Corporation, where our money is backed up by the United States Treasury. And so what's interesting is that both Hoover and Roosevelt believed in a balanced budget. Now, FDR believed um, he read um, John Maynard Keynes' um, uh, economic proposal of Keynesian economics. And what that is, is, is you deficit spend your way, government does, out of a depression. And then once the, you're out of the depression, you go back to a balanced budget. OK, um, now Keynesian, once he sees us deficit spend all the way to present day, he would probably roll over in his grave because that's not what he intended. Um, you continually deficit spend, you deficit spend in a time of crisis and then you go back to a balanced budget. OK. And so that that is something to take note of. I, I think FDR probably would have pushed for a balanced budget after World War II had he had he lived. Of course, the Cold War changes things. And we'll cover that in a later lecture in module three. Now, one of the things that, that Roosevelt is going to do is um, he appointed um, these <clears throat> brilliant men that he called the Brain Trust. A lot of them were professors from Columbia and Harvard universities like Raymond Molly, uh, Rexford Tugwell, Adolf A. Burrell, Felix Frankfurter, um, and this turned into a very talented cabinet and also included Secretary of the Interior Harold L. Ice uh, um, and Frances Perkins, um, um, who was the first female cabinet member in American history. She was uh, over the Department of Labor. Henry A. Wallace was over agriculture. Henry Morgenthau Jr. was the Secretary of the Treasury and financier Bernard Baruch was also influential as well. And Bernard Baruch was played an important role during World War One. Um, and one of the um, government programs. Many young Ivy League, uh, League lawyers came and worked in Washington and under his administration. So a lot of the New Deal programs were actually invented by these guys, not by FDR, but FDR was able to get them passed. And because they have overwhelming Democratic majority in Congress, they can pass uh, more legislation in the first 100 days of a, a, a presidential um, uh, office than any other president before or since in American history. So FDR is going to classify um, his his New Deal programs in either relief, recovery, or reform. Okay, so you're not going to have to know every single New Deal legislation, <clears throat> but the ones that are listed <clears throat> on your your study guide are the ones that I would make sure that I knew. Okay, and so every New Deal program is going to fall into immediate relief. Okay, that's short term, just trying to help the people from, from losing their homes or starving to recovery, which are mid range, like trying to get the country out of the Great Depression or reform, which are long standing things to keep the country from going in the Great Depression afterwards. So like the FDIC and the Securities Exchange Commissions are reforms. We still have those today. They're long term to try to prevent, you know, um, um, spec buying stock on the margin and speculation. Um, trying to pretend, uh, prevent bank foreclosures the way they are, the uh, bank collapses like they did um, during the early part of the Great Depression. And then um, FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, that was the one I went blank on earlier. Um, that is to provide um, low, uh, low down payments for first time home buyers. Um, and then um, with the Social Security Act, that is designed to you know, allow senior citizens to eventually leave the economy and retire. Um, and so we'll talk about the differences between uh, each of the three as we, we cover uh, New Deal programs. Okay. So here is what FDR's goals are, is we want to renew democracy, power in the hands of the people, restore confidence in the banking system, which he does, stimulate the economy, eventually happens, particularly when World War II happens, put people back to work, that does happen, and restore self-confidence. Okay. Um, and so relief, recovery, and reform, the three R's, relief, recovery, reform. Make sure you, I would memorize that if I were you. 
Now, this right here, um, this is the alphabet agencies. You're, going to, you're not going to memorize all this. Okay, this is a lot. Um, and so, um, but I'm going to talk about some of the more important ones. I'm not going to cover every single New Deal program. Um, if you want to do that, then your, your textbook covers those things and so forth. So the first thing he does is he tries to protect uh, and restore confidence in the American banking system. So uh, the day after FDR was inaugurated, he called for a bank holiday. Okay, basically what that is, is it closed all the banks in the United States. Okay, he called Congress into a special session and um, within only after only 38 minutes of deliberation, it's the fastest Congress has ever passed a bill in American history. He passes the Emergency Banking Act. Okay, Congressman knew that the banking system was a major crisis, had to be corrected right then. So he convinced the public that would, uh, in one of his fireside chats, um, by basically passing the Glass-Steagall Bank and Reform Act in 1933. What this did is it created the FDIC. This is a reform, okay? Not relief or recovery it is a long-term thing to prevent another Great Depression. And we, we've had recessions, okay, but we never had a Great Depression since then. So the FDIC, we can agree, is a good thing. It's backed up by um, the United States Treasury. So at the time, each bank deposit Okay, of your account up to $2,500 was protected by the U.S. Treasury. Today, it's about $250,000 per account. Uh, and so I hope I get to the point where I have to go to a new bank and have a new account because I've got over $250,000 in my checking account. I haven't got to that problem yet in my life. Okay, so Glass-Steagall Glass Bank and Reform Act is what creates the FDIC. Okay, um, with, with about 4,000 banks collapsing months before, only 61 collapsed in 1934. So it does help. Okay. Does it prevent everything? No, but it does help. Okay. Next thing is a homeowner's loan corporation. Okay. Then what this did is to try to prevent all the future um, foreclosures. So Glass-Steagall Bank and Reform Act was a reform. Homeowner's loan corporation is relief. It's immediate aid to those that are trying to prevent them from having foreclosure. Okay. Allow them to refinance their home so they could try to pay back their mortgages. Okay. Now, this right here is the most popular New Deal program in American history um, and one that we can see the positive effects in all 50 states across our country. It is called the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, I have been to numerous parks um, that were um, constructed um, by the CCC. Um, I love the CCC and uh, every American can um, still benefit from the effects of the CCC today by going to a lot of state parks and national parks in our country. What they do is they build um, uh, roads. Um, they replant a forest. For instance, when um, Smoky Mountain National Park was acquired through a lot of private uh, uh, donations, um, it was heavily logged. And so most of the trees in the park were gone. The CCC built tr uh, planted trees. They built roads to establish the park. They built uh, park buildings, um, bridges throughout the park. And today, Smoky Mountain National Park is the most visited national park in our country. And if you haven't seen it in your life, you need to travel to go see it. It is gorgeous. There is a reason why nine to 12 million visitors um, go there annually. Okay. Uh, and so forth. Um, so who does it hire? It hires men from about the age of 18 to 25. Um, young men, they were single primarily. And the goal is, is to try to keep them out of the workforce. So that way, um, jobs, other jobs can be reserved for men who are married with families who are feeding children. Okay. It's brilliant. Um, and 25% of their paycheck goes back to feed their families. So, um, I've been, I've seen parts of Mount Rainier National Park that were constructed by the CCC. I've been to Devil's Den State Park in, in Northwest Arkansas. A lot of that stuff was built by the CCC. You could look at state parks across the country, um, Dallas, uh, Metroplex, White Rock Lake, a lot of the buildings that were built around White Rock Lake, uh, famous area where people bike and run and so forth and, and um, go out there for picnics um, or go paddling on the lake. Um, a lot of those buildings were built by the CCC. In fact, there's a, a, a statue of a CCC worker um, that's on, near one of those buildings around White Rock Lake and so forth. So the CCC is tremendously popular. Americans agree that it does a great thing for our country. About 300,000 men worked, and these men worked their tail off uh, and so forth, building uh, roads and, and, and uh, planting trees and creating parks, man-made ponds, man-made lakes uh, with the help of the uh, Army Corps of Engineers. You can see young men signing up to work, and they worked their tails off, okay? These are men planting trees, OK? 
Okay. The next one is recovery. This one was probably the most controversial. Surprisingly, it doesn't uh, end. Um, it doesn't get declared unconstitutional. Two other New Deal programs get declared unconstitutional, but the Tennessee Valley Authority does not. Now, we don't see the TVA around today because the power plants get sold off after World War II um, to private um, electricity uh, companies and so forth. But what it was, it was a government owned corporation that would produce cheap hydroelectric power and encourage economic development in the flood prone River Valley. Critics have sold it as a creeping socialism because it is government owned electricity. Let's look at where the TVA is really gonna help. It helps some of the poorest areas of our country. Okay, um, and so let's look at uh, this. Now this is primarily benefits these areas, okay? What they did is they dammed up certain rivers, okay? Now, a couple things that happens from this. By creating a dam, you can create a hydroelectric power plant, okay? And it provides electricity to a large part of the country who did not have it. That's a good thing. Um, it also, because we typically when you dam up an area, you create a, re a water reservoir. Well, that did flood um, different people's lands. So what they did is the federal government had to come in and buy their lands and move them elsewhere, okay? Particularly valleys and so forth. Now, if you're a, a fan of uh, protection of private property, then you don't like this, okay? Uh, but if you see the overall good that it does for a country, then you would be in favor of it. So it was very controversial. Um, it also provided jobs because it provided jobs building the hydroelectric plants, okay? And then people running them and so forth. And so um, it, it was controversial. The, the, uh, uh, the Supreme Court was about to listen to it um, and declared unconstitutional later, but I'll, I'll, I'll cover later why that it actually um, ends up not getting declared unconstitutional. One of the things though that the hydroelectric dams do is prevent uh, routine flooding. And so you can regulate that. And um, at this time in this area, 94% of property owners and 98% of tenants did not have electricity. Um, also, 30% of property owners and 41% of tenants had no toilet facilities whatsoever. So this provides modern plumbing and electricity. These are great infrastructure improvements. Okay, And you can see right here from these statistics, some of the poorest region of our country. This is a reservoir. So this area right here would not have been flooded had it not been for this dam. Okay, So this is a man-made lake reservoir. And that's one of the power plants. Okay, so lock and dam system. And so, um, and this is a critic uh, political cartel on the left, and then, um, and so forth. And this one's critical on the right as well, saying he might go on to creating countrywide socialism. Another thing that happens at this time is they repeal the, 20, uh, the 18th Amendment with the 21st Amendment. So how you remember that? 18, can you drink? No. 21, can you drink? Yes. So it repeals prohibition in 1933. All right, let's cover the, the Agricultural Adjustment Act. This was recovery, okay? So if you look at the TVA, um, it was more uh, recovery as well. But the AAA, which also is one of the two things that declare, it gets declared unconstitutional, um, is a middle range one. It is designed to get the country out of the Great Depression. And so what it did is it protected farmers from price drops and overproduction. And so how can you do that? Well, it paid farmers to not farm as much. Okay. Now, what ends up happening is um, how do they pay farmers not to farm as much? Well, they taxed food, um, um, canned food uh, or producers and so forth. So those who, who took food and then canned them that taxed them to pay for it. Well, the Supreme Court taught that was unconstitutional. It really is kind of an unfair way to, you paid farmers not to do their job. So what it did is it tried to keep the farmers from flooding the markets with too much crops because if you have too much supply, it drives down the price. So what it did is it, it paid farmers not to farm as much. At one point during the Great Depression, it was cheaper for dairy farmers to just pour their milk out in the ditch than to take it to the actual market. Um, now, also it was designed to prevent another dust bowl, and I'll cover the dust bowl in part three of this topic. So the Agricultural Adjustment Act, um, yeah, that's how it paid for them and so forth. Um, but the acts, um, the acts benefits were not evenly distrib distributed. Subsidies went primarily to owners of large and medium sized farms who often cut production by reducing the amount of land they rented to tenants and sharecroppers. So small scale farmers were not benefited by this. This one um, probably wasn't as one of the, the greater new.
program was developed. Okay. Now the next one that gets declared unconstitutional is sometimes you'll see NRA, not to be confused with the National Rifle Association, but um, sometimes you'll see it in IRA. It stands for National Industrial Recovery Act. Sometimes you'll see it National Recovery Act. Um, established a system of self-government in more than 600 industries. Each industry regulated itself by hammering out a government-approved code of prices and production quotas similar to those for farm products. So this is recovery, middle range, trying to get the country out of the Great Depression. So let's say I was a grocery store owner. All right, and there's three grocery stores in my town. By joining the National Industrial Recovery uh, Group, I would agree that we would charge the same prices for milk, same pr prices for beef, same price for everything. So that way they're not trying to compete and slash prices. Everybody's going to charge the same price. Also agree to a basic minimum wage um, for those that were part of it. OK, and so um, it is designed to enforce codes uh, and, and, and uh, production quotas and fair prices. The codes outlaw child labor and set minimum wages and maximum hours for adult workers. This act also gave unions the right to organize and bargain collectively. So union organizers love this. This was important for the growth of the labor movement in the 1930s. To get the public on board, the NRA launched an extensive public relations campaign. And the symbol was the eagle. And this is where the Philadelphia Eagles professional football team took their mascot. Okay, because Philadelphia is one of the areas that benefited from that. So that's where the eagle comes from. Okay. This one gets declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, and I'll cover that later. Let's see, it was done a good PR campaign. All right. Another one that um, is a immediate relief, not a recovery or reform, but immediate aid is what's called the Federal Emergency Relief Administration. This provided funds to the states for relief programs. In his first two hours in office, the director, Harry Hopkins, distributed $5 million to FARA. It lasted two years and spent about a billion dollars. OK. So gave money to the states. The states immediately gave it out as they saw fit. OK. Now, let's look at the Public Works Administration. This one was a massive one. A lot of construction projects happened because of the PWA. Here's Harold L. Ikes, the Secretary of the Interior. It's a recovery one, um, not a relief or a reform one. Um, and so it spent about four, three to four billion on 34,000 projects like public buildings, highways, and a lot of parkways. Um, after the, the caution system of Ike's approving projects in November 1933, FDR established the C Civilian Works Administration. He appointed Harry Hopkins to head it up and he put 2.6 million men and women to work within 30 days. Okay. So Harold L. Ike's was a little bit conservative. So he appointed um, another guy named Harry Hopkins to do the CWA. In January of 1934, the CWA had funded the employment of 4 million Americans in the public works projects, repairing bridges, which is great, um, building highways and, constr and constructing public buildings and setting up community projects. It quickly died out once it had spent all of its funds. And all these programs were called the alphabet agencies. Only LBJ was able to pass as many programs in a short amount of time. And that's what he does with the uh, uh, Great Society. OK, now a reform thing that we still have around today is to regulate the stock market. Now, what does that mean? Is it means control price? I'm sorry. No. But what it does, it outlaws buying stock on the margin and it also prosecuted fraud. So if you have insider trading um, and so forth, that could be that would be prosecuted by the SEC. Um, the commission had broad powers to regulate companies that issued stock and bonds to the public and set rules for margin, which is credit transactions and prevent stock sales by those with inside information on corporate plans. So if you had um, insider trading is where you have information the public is not privy to, that, that would be a legal way of where you can um, profit economically from that. The Banking Act of 1935 authorized the president to appoint a new board of governors uh, of the Federal Reserve System, established by Woodrow Wilson, placing control of interest rates and other money market pol uh, policies at the federal level rather than regional banks. Now we're going to cover the New Deal under attack in part two.